So thanks for coming. As you said, I'm Brian Curtin. Uh, just here to talk about what's been happening in uh, the Windows build of Python. And I kind of wanted to start out with uh, a little, little number about download stats, because you kind of hear sometimes that, one, no one uses Python 3. You know, obviously, no one does. No one uses Windows either. It's all, it's, of course, it's a Mac Linux world. This is very, very wrong. Um, so we have, if you go to python.org slash web stats, there's a little uh, statistical, kind of, it analyzes like the, uh, um, the web server for what files and stuff is being downloaded. I've wrote a little scraper for that. It's on, the code's on Bitbucket. It's very specific to the, the pi.org web stats. I'm sure you could probably manipulate it for other, other places. It takes this data created by Webalizer. Uh, and starting in June, January 2006, every month, uh, the previous month's data is, is analyzed, and you can figure out what's been downloaded at what rates. So going back from 2006, you can kind of see the, uh, the reddish on the left is 2.5, the green in the middle third is uh, 2.6, and then on the right is 2.7. In the, inside there, you got a couple other things, uh, 3.0, 3.1, 3.2, 3.2, as they happened. Oh, my shit's coming off here. Um, that's kind of hard to see anyways. If you look at this, this is all downloads, uh, regardless of version, since 2006 until the current. Um, the very top, 3.2, when 3.2 was released, that was the biggest single month that we had of all downloads of all Python versions. Thought that was pretty cool. And when 2.6 came out, that's actually kind of like right in the center, you see that big jump. 2.6 came out, and Python just shot through the roof. Um, so, and this is all Windows downloads. This is not Mac, Linux, anything like that. I just look for uh, EXEs and MSIs that were downloaded throughout that period. So, in general, Python started to get much more popular, and then in Windows in general just shoots, shoots right through the roof. Um, and since those, you can't really read those charts, what it kind of shows is uh, in September 2006, when 2.5 came out, about 320,000 downloads of the uh, 2.5 installers were done. 1.1 million for 2.6 when it came out, and then following that, 2.7 and all the threes, in their first month, they get about 600 to 650,000 downloads. And I'll specify in a second what I mean by downloads. I haven't said like users, but I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, so a couple more interesting numbers if you look at this. So the single, uh, so 1, point, 1, point, uh, 1 million people downloaded 265. That was the single largest number of any specific like point release that ever happened. So in March 2010, was a pretty big month. A lot of people wanted that. Uh, and again, I, I already pointed out the thing when 3.2 came out, that was the biggest month of all total downloads at 2.2 million. It's kind of funny. Um, 2,400 downloads of 1.5 still happen roughly each month going back to 2006. So people are still downloading it for whatever reason. 2011, so if I just look at the last year, 21 million downloads of, of Python on Windows. If you look at kind of 2.7 and, and, and 3.2, the, the heads of those respective 2 and 3 versions, um, 3.2 is a little over half at 450 versus about 850,000. This kind of shows the last year in a glance. Take away all the, the minor versions like 2.2 and whatnot. Um, you can kind of just see what's happening. Thought that was kind of cool. People are actually using it. It's not the, all the lies you read on Reddit and Hacker News that no one uses Windows. There are a couple things to consider when looking at these numbers, though. Um, build automation, test automation. There are probably people who, as part of their product, download a Windows installer, run it, test some things out. Um, web crawlers, which I, I looked through a couple things. It's a very, very small amount that, that's represented in there. It certainly wouldn't change something in half or anything. Uh, in terms of some of the numbers where I said in the first month, it's kind of hard because the, the numbers are, are, are calculated at the first of the month. So the first of July has all the June numbers. If the release happened June 25th, it's kind of hard to figure out how many downloads happened in those first couple days and then kind of figure it out. So I've kind of try, tried to be safe in saying when something actually came out the middle of the month kind of estimate what it looks like. So don't take these as like a canonical number of like, he said this many was in that month. Um, there's also, you know, developer downloads versus part of a product. Um, and again, this is downloads, not installs. We don't track who installs it. I just know that you downloaded it. Um, doesn't count things like active state and end thought. That's, uh, 
would be totally separate. Um, and so that was kind of the, what made me do this. So anyways, in terms of what's new, there's uh, an installer change being made. Um, anyone who has started out with Python has probably done this. Uh, that's kind of the, if you're, especially if you're a new person to programming in general, not even just Python, someone tells you Python's awesome, it's easy, yeah, just go install it, type Python. Doesn't work. Um, and it's, so the usual install steps have kind of been to complete the installer, add it to the path, do something. Someone tells you, oh, you have to pip install XYZ. Oh, the script folder is not on the path. Add that to the path, go on. So you, and, and for beginners and even for people that are not like super advanced, having to deal with environment variables and all this kind of stuff just to get the very simple things running, such as start, start Python and then start pip, uh, it's kind of a discouraging task to be involved with. So one of the solutions, and I've just rewrote re re all these talks. I just had lunch with Martin the other day, and we came to a, a new conclusion that there will be C colon, Python XY, and then the bin folder. The scripts folder is full of effectively binaries. Python.exe is binary, so Python.exe is going to go in there. And the installer will have the option to add this to the path, which makes it much easier for, uh, for getting that started. So I think a lot of people will like that. Um, and some people might be thinking, why change now? It's 2012. We've been doing, this has been going on forever, 21 years or whatever. I don't know how long the Windows installer has been, but it's been a long time. Um, it, you know, it's been an unofficial step. I, probably, I, I guarantee everyone's done it if you've done Windows stuff, or at least you know how to do it, or you, you, know, you would understand what's going on. Um, a lot of what drove me to actually get involved in this was talking to a lot of education people. So I talked to Mike Mueller the other day. First thing he mentioned, that I didn't even mention that I know anything about Windows or that I was giving this talk. He was talking specifically about the path issue where his, his people start to type Python, nothing works. Then I'm like, oh, I'm actually giving this talk, so that, that's beneficial. Dave Beasley has said the same thing. Zed Shaw ranted about it on Twitter. Um, surprise. Um, in the end, I think this is going to be beneficial to a lot of people, especially because the Hello World tutorial that everyone does, Unless you know the path to where Python was installed, you usually can't do it. Um, and also because a patch was actually written. I'm sure people have, been, have known about this and wanted this for a while. Uh, to my knowledge, there were no patches for it. I don't know anything about MSI, but I'm slowly learning, trying to get it out there. And the very small text says, I actually did this totally different way that I'm about to show. And then talking to Martin, who's the Windows master, um, showed me the, the, one, the, the better way. So I'm actually going to show a small demo of what this looks like. So, seen this, install for all users. Do, 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 do. The new option is this prepend, ah, it's probably hard to see that. It says prepend a path. So it'll, it'll add SQL and Python 3.3 bin to the system path. Go through and install it. Uh, it would do that. This is my option was going to be this little checkbox you could do but it's kind of hard to hook that stuff up. So anyways, that's what that will look like. And that'll be in 3.3. And back to the talk. Uh, another thing is that this is optional and it has to be off by default. We have, you know, we still have the Python 2 and Python 3 situation. Um, and it's kind of a more an advanced feature. As much as it's beginner, it's also fairly advanced in that you have to really know what you're doing and why you're doing it. If you just keep installing Pythons and keep adding to the path, you're screwing up the last one you installed. And I'm sure a lot of people start with 2.7, that's what they want to use because they're doing their Django, whatever, and they want to try three on the side. If this is just on by default, now they're on three and they're gonna have to figure out how to get it out and all that kind of stuff. So at least for now, this could change in the future, who knows, it's gonna start off by default. There is a bug report if you want to find, uh, follow it, 3561. Uh, and then just a very quick couple slides. In 3.3, we're moving to Visual Studio 2010, just in time for 2011, or uh, version 11. It's mostly done. There is a branch for it, uh, packaging, and a couple of things. Still, a few tests need to pass. One of the things that kind of brought this up was, for one, we're now a couple versions behind as soon as 11 turns into whatever version it will actually number be. And there's been a rise in contributors kind of coming in with 2010 problems. They don't know that we use 2008. They go to MSDN and it tells you to download the 2010 Express. For the most part, it actually works. There are some 
uh, some issues, some a lot of warnings. People kind of get discouraged about, or they're, they're unsure of what's happening. They don't know that it should be actually um, 2008. And it, when 11 actually comes out, it will be able to read the 2010 solutions from what I'm reading. Uh, it's not really solidified yet, but uh, that will be happening. And one reason we can't move straight to 11 is because apparently, or so far, uh, Visual Studio 11 cannot create Windows XP binaries, which we still support and will probably support for a while. Um, so recent features that I think people don't seem to know about um, for one reason or another, it could be because they're kind of hard to use, um, one of them being OS.simlink, and it's not really our fault. It's kind of the way Windows does things. OS.simlink is actually really cool. Uh, a lot of places could use it but it requires that you run your command prompt as administrator. It does not matter that your account has administrative privileges. It's the context that the command prompt is run in. So you have to have this uh, create symbolic link privilege. Typically, you would do it by you know, right-click on your command prompt, start as administrator. Um, works just as nicely as it does after you've done that on Linux. Um, I symlink herf to derf, and it works. There's also hard links, which do not require this little dance of uh, administrative privileges. Work just as nicely. And another thing, uh, OS.kill. I think Michael Ford actually got me to write this based on what Iron Python people had done. Uh, this is another new in 3.2, so it's still pretty new. Um, it's actually useful, but in uh, kind of wonky ways. So now you can send control C and control break to, to subprocesses. I used to have a problem at my old job where we would start up these subprocesses to do all these things and then to kill them and make sure they terminate. It's kind of kind of weird. If if you end up having to just OS that kill with some process ID, um, just totally terminates it. You could do something with like message passing to tell it to shut down, but it's also nice to just handle control C and control break. So control C is actually the harder one, or the harder one to work with because when I, I, don't, I, don't, I still don't understand all the Windows specifics to it. Uh, basically, start a subprocess, or start a process group, and then start subprocess from that, and they will be able to handle Control-C and shut down nicely. So if you were to farm your stuff out, uh, I believe this works via, via multiprocessing as well, to farm stuff out the processes, make sure everything shuts down and uh, nice and clean. Just have a, a simple little script that's, there's a master that starts up a pool, that starts up the subprocesses, and then the children handle these control C signals and return if they handle it properly. Um, if you run it, you would see that I started up three children, it waits for a second, they handle the events, and then they pass back, they handle the keyboard interrupt. Control break is very similar, uh, but it's a lot easier. It doesn't have the intermediate step where you have to create this, uh, the one that farms out the processes. You can just do it right in there. So I have my master master that creates. Uh, hold on one second. Yeah. So yeah, I just I, I have this master that just creates a subprocess and then it kills it two different ways with the nice signal to handle it. Otherwise, it, it rudely terminates it with the value one two three. So I have my my script that has a, a, a handler routine that handles these events and it prints that it's stopping if it was stopped nicely. And then if you actually run this, you'll see that you can run it. It stopped nicely, and then if you hand, force it with this, uh, basically it calls terminate process with a return code, it just is abruptly killed. Um, it's kind of cool. I, I think it could be useful in certain places um, in order to make sure things are, are, are stopping nicely and working nicely. Um, another new thing for 3.3 is going to be PEP 3151. This is another one of Antoine Petro, I believe I'm saying his name right, his uh, handiworks reworking the exception hierarchy for OS and IO. There's a little part in there about Windows error that I think could be nice for, it, it, it's actually a really nice pep as it is, making much more fine-grained exceptions um, so you can handle like file not found exception instead of um, OS error and then checking the uh, error no and stuff like that. So the Windows part is if you ever look, uh, if you want to handle Windows error and some cross-platform stuff, you have to make sure Windows error exists, do a couple dances, kind of sucks. Um, you also have to look at win error anyway, which is also an OS error. So it kind of removes kind of this needless distinction of having that. This, here's an example in the standard library of where this exists, handling OS error, which could actually be an 
a Windows error and then do something special with it, also do some other stuff. Uh, so yeah, what affects you is that Windows error is alias to OS error for now. And uh, yeah, that's kind of pointless distinction is removed. Uh, in terms of Windows error being totally removed, that's a potential topic for Python 4. Hopefully that'll be a nice PyCon where we talk about all that stuff. And uh, yeah, the cross-platform handling becomes easier because you don't have to worry about checking. Of course, it'll still be there, but you'll be all right. PEP397 is one that I think is probably the most interesting in this whole talk. And a lot of people seem to like it. I'm talking to people at lunch, talking to people around the hallways, it seems like uh, something people really like, especially because people actually are, as, as my graphs show, people are actually using Python 3. So the short of it is that it kind of is a shebang processor for Windows scripts. Um, what it actually does is look at that. There's a, a nice little launcher called py.exe. It finds various Python installations for you and given what you have in the first line, as you would on, on a, a Unix script, it will right, use the right Python for it. Uh, I have a couple little examples here just to show. Uh, so I, I have Py, the, the, the Python installer, PY, on my, uh, on my path nicely. And I just run Py hello. Actually, let me just do okay. All it does is just print out the, uh, uh, the version and the, like, the executable that's running with, so you can see where it's getting it from. So if I run pi hello, you can see it's, it's my 3.2, uh, the, the standard installed ones, equal in Python 3.2. I can also specify in there that I want to run with an explicit, I want to override the shebang that says run uh, Python 3. So I want to do it with dash 2, which is going to find a Python 2. And let me just space that up a little bit. It found my 272 nicely. And there's a couple other options you can do here. There's uh, config files. There's a, a py.ini, which lives in your, uh, your roaming profile. So it's in my C colon users, Brian, app data, roaming, py.ini. I can just give it um, another kind of command to run. So it's kind of at notepad, so I can't really open it up. So what it says dev equals the path to my uh, debug build a Python from my, my checkout. So if I run a script that, oh, my ini file, so it's gonna run, so I, it's kinda hard to see there. So I have the, uh, the pound bang dev that will look in the ini file, find the path to where that dev is. So if I do, uh, hello ini, Slow to start up a little bit because it's a debug build. You can see it and when it prints out the system executable. It's my, my debug Python and my little reference counting. There's also another way you can do this. You could just give it a full, fully qualified path in the shebang. So, so you can see this one, I actually have the pound bang, my full path. If I do hello, fully qualified, it's the same thing. It's my 64 bit debug build. Runs the same. I believe that's correct. You could do whatever. Pretty much, it's it's not intended to do that, but yeah, you could pretty much put whatever you want in there. Any command that you put after the equals will be run. So it could do the same thing. So yeah, this is, um, so, the, so yeah, it's PEP397. There's a reference implementation called PyLaunch around Bitbucket by another CPython developer, Vinay Sajip. I don't believe he's here, but uh, there's also installers created so that you can get the source, you can build it nicely. He actually has the pre-built installers that can either install it to your program files or system-wide. Uh, I just did the system-wide one, so it puts it on the path nicely. So that's another option. Um, and I'm gonna, there's a little treat here. Um, I would take questions right now, but I'm gonna hand it off to Christian Tismer, um, a longtime Python community member, a stackless creator, member of uh, one of the, the, the co-creators of PyPy, and he has a little, uh, little bit of information here to share. Christian. Take this one. Uh, do I have to? Ah. Yes, thank you very much. Um, 
uh, intruding into uh, Brian's nice talk just to uh, tell you a little bit what, what's going on with um, Windows, of course, but I'm working right now on uh, PyPy support for Windows 64, and there's a couple of problems with that, and I just wanted to mention uh, the problems where I'm kind of stuck and I need some people to help, maybe, and that's the reason why I just take the chance to uh, talk about that. So, um, the, the problem with Windows 64 uh, is uh, not really a Windows problem, so I'm not angry with Windows or something, it's just, it happens to be the first platform where PyPy uh, um, has difficulties to uh, create itself as an exact copy of a running Python. So in the case of Windows, we have a 32-bit uh, uh, int type, which is not large enough to hold a pointer type, and PyPy needs uh, this assumption to, to hold all the time. So um, Windows 64 is the first uh, situation where PyPy really has to uh, be more flexible and toss certain assumptions. Um, and it happens to, to be Windows, and I happen to be the one who tries to support that. Uh, yeah, the approach to, to do that is um, getting rid of certain dependencies. PyPy depends on sys.maxint, and uh, sys.maxint defines what is an integer and what is a, uh, a long um, in the implementation of, of uh, Python, Py, PyPy. And um, all of these things have to be generalized and uh, removed. So actually, it's not a really hard problem, and it's not very Windows specific. It's just thousands of thousands of uh, of uh, tedious uh, tiny problems to solve. Um, I worked on that since uh, uh, last summer for yeah three times two weeks, so uh, I always said I'm 90% there, and the third 90% is over, now I need somebody to uh, make it really happen. So the current status is, uh, simply put, it works without anything, so uh, a naked, naked uh, Windows 64 port of Piper is working without the JIT and without any modules. Uh, the support for JIT and modules is uh, no problem, it's simply a lot of work. And it's too much for one person. Well, the goals, and the goals are pretty simple. Get rid of the 1,500 failing tests. <laughs> Make it ready enough for inclusion of the branch into uh, the, the main trunk. Uh, and we were really re ready with that, and then I want to turn back to what my real task is since many years. I want to support stackless PyPy with uh, JIT and everything, and uh, I can do that after Windows is done. So please join the PyPy Sprint, help me in any way. Uh, there's a slot for everybody, you can ha help me very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, Brian, and uh, thanks, Christian. If there are any questions, we do have some time for questions for either uh, either Brian or Christian. I don't have a question, but I'm from Microsoft, and I just wanted to say thank you guys for doing this, yeah. both of you. Thank you. Thanks as well. Uh, I wanted to ask about the OS Kill. I, I was using that recently and comparing it against a, a Stack Overflow article I said I, I read, where they were using OS Kill and passing zero instead of one of the constants defined in the signal module. And when I was testing that in Windows, I found that zero means something different on Windows. I guess the Control C and Control Break are mapped to zero and one, and zero and one are different on Unix. Did that ever come up when you were looking at the implementation? And would it make sense for those constants to maybe map to different numbers? 
I uh, did not come across that. Uh, yeah, per perhaps that should be changed. Um, I guess it would be backwards incompatible, but I don't know who's using this, if anyone. So I I, maybe we could change it. I have no idea. Uh, it's certainly something to look into. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. I've got a question about the uh, path change. You mentioned uh, that it'll be C Python 3.3 bin that'll be in the path, mm -hmm. and python.exe will be there. For those of us who are finding python.exe through the registry today and uh, where the Python's installed, will there still be python.exe in C colon python 3.3 or a sim link to it uh, in the bin directory, or will it be completely gone? Um, I guess that's still potentially up for debate. We had thought, and this was just from lunch on Friday. <laughs> um, just have one and have it in the bin folder. Um, is that, I guess now could be this debate, uh, good or I bad? Mean, I can update my code before 3.3 ships to find it in the bin directory for 3.3, uh -huh. but I don't know, you know, there might be other people finding it through the registry and assuming it's at uh, right in the install path that's in the registry. Uh -huh. um, I, I guess another, another way to kind of get around this is, is pushing documentation, because I know there's a way to find it from distutils to find out where it should be and find that path. Yeah. I don't know if that's a possibility. That me, it's, but <laughs> okay. I mean, I can update my code. We, we, there could, we could also have a, a new registry key, apparently, or possibly to that, say yeah. uh, in bin path or something yeah. like that, where it would say, yeah, it's actually that. Right, yeah, because ideally we wouldn't want to have you find the install one and then right. append bin because then we oh we change bin to bin two or uh, whatever we yeah. change it to then you're screwed again. That sounds like a good idea. Yeah. All yeah. Right. Thanks. Just a quick follow up to that. I don't know if you've considered the virtual env concept and how that applies to this. It's always been a frustration to me that on Windows the bins are in scripts and the, and on on Unix they're in bin and so all of my scripts that expect to run in a virtual env have to be Windows specific or have to address that. And so it'll be nice if this change applies to virtual environments also. Um, I don't know that it's what, I, I guess I, I don't really know much about virtual and how it's implemented. We, well, so we could certainly talk to them and tell them, hey, this is going to be the new thing. Yeah. I, do, I, mean, well, I actually does support three, so I guess it'll be, they'll, maybe they'll condition it on if you want a 3.3 one, do it. There is? That's, that's up for, that's for yeah, oh yeah, okay. I, I thought you meant it was already there. So, is that in it's or? It's not in there yet. I mean, we're, we're having it in yeah. So well, if, yeah, if that's accepted and that's in and that's implemented, then we'll, we would certainly have to uh, make that work, play nicely with each other. Yeah. Um, so if, we're in an, if I'm in an environment where um, we actually install Python in one spot and then run it from either a UNC path or a map drive, um, what is the level of support for something like that or um, any gotchas? Um, level of support for that. It should, does it, I, I would think it would work. Does, does it not work? Uh, it does, but I just wanted to make sure that if it's a supported configuration or if there's certain things that are placed into the registry in the system that's installing it that may not, may not be absolutely necessary in, a, in the other environment but may cause I, I guess I'm just not sure how tight it is to the specific system it's installed on by design. Yeah. Um, in terms of running like a, over from like a map drive or something like that, I, mean, I would think it would work, and apparently it does work. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I mean, it, it's not a tested configuration as okay. far as I'm aware. Right. Uh, it probably wouldn't be hard to, t to set that up okay. uh, yeah, in yeah. one of our build slaves or something like that. But uh, right. I, guess, I, don't, I don't have a great answer for that. Sorry. No, that's fine. And um, uh, as a sort of as a follow-up, the, um, uh, I like to be able to use um, a portable, um, uh, like a flash drive, there are por portable applications that are available, and being able to relatively refer back to a, um, so if I've got a scripts directory and I've got a, maybe a Python directory on that same flash drive, I like to be able to go up a couple of directories and then go down into my Python to find the Python executable. Any support for that so that Sys. I... Sys.executable. Sys.executable. Okay. Okay. All right, I'll look for that. Thank you. Yeah. If there are no other questions, uh, thank you very much, Brian. Thank you, Christian. Thanks.